Hi, I am Tom Christensen of Neurochrome. In this build video, I will show you how to build one of these Power86 circuit boards. The Power86 is a power supply that is intended for use in an audio power amplifier. To build the Power86, you will need a Power86 circuit board, which you buy from my website, neurochrome.com, and you will need a bag of parts. I bought these from Mauser, and when you buy my circuit board, you will receive a download link for the design documentation, and in the appendix A1, you will find a link to a project that I have set up with Mauser Electronics. You just click the link, uh, select add to cart and check out like you would at any other online store. You can buy the parts in many other places, but mouse is convenient. You'll also need some tools. Specifically, you'll need a pair of side cutters and a pair of pliers. You'll also need to solder. And I recommend using a soldering iron with a tip that's about 1.6 to 2 millimeters wide. You will need some solder as well. I'm going to use solder with water soluble flux because I wash the board after to get rid of uh, the flux. If you don't have water soluble flux or solder with water soluble flux, um, that's okay. Use RMA or no clean instead. Uh, and if you have no idea what I just said, I recommend that you go and read the article on my website called Choosing Solder. It's really up to you whether you populate the parts in sequence, so say R1, R2, R3, R4, or if you populate by parts value or part number. So let's say all 10 ohm resistors go on first, then all 100 ohm, all 1 kilo ohm, and so on. Um, I prefer to go by part number, and that's simply because it means I spend less time fishing around for a specific bag of parts in a large box of parts. So I'll start by sorting the parts like I've done here, and I'll just grab the pile of resistors, and I'll take the first bag out of the pile, and I'll go, oh, these are 5.6 kilo ohms. They go in spot, let's say, R1 and R7, um, and I'll populate those. Then I'll grab the next bag in the pile. For me, that's just more efficient but it's really up to you. As long as the parts get in the right locations, life is good. Let's build the board. I'd like to touch on one thing before I start soldering here. It can be a bit unwieldy to have a full roll of solder um, sitting on your workbench and trying to, you know, unspool while you're trying to solder and it just turns into a mess and the spool usually ends up on the floor and that's a pain in the rear. So one trick I learned uh, many years ago is to unspool, you know, a reasonable amount of solder and then wind it up on your two fingers like so and in a moment there now we have a little bit of solder that'll fit neatly on the palm of your hand so that makes it just a lot easier to work with so anyway let's get going i will start with these two resistors here i'll just snip off the tape here and they should be mounted right here in R1 and R2 over here. So one way to do that is to hold the part over uh, the footprint where it's supposed to be mounted. Then you grab with the pliers at the inside edge of the mounting hole and then bend 90 degrees. Then stab the part through the board like so and then grab the part again at the inside oh, come on inside of the mounting hole if it'll cooperate like that give or take a little bit in and then bend over 90 degrees and then drop the part in the footprint like so it should just fit slide right through the board then I bend the lead, leads over by about 45 degrees. It's probably no surprise that uh, my hands are finely calibrated to the 0.4 inch spacing that's used with these uh, quarter watt resistors. So, you know, with a few 40-ish years of uh, practice, sometimes it sucks being good at math. <laughs> um, you can bend the leads to the correct spacing and just drop the part into the board and bend 45 degrees. This blue 
mat here is a uh, ESD mat. So it's uh, electrostatic dissipative and it's grounded in one end. Um, it's also heat um, sensitive to heat, so heat sensitive. Uh, so I prefer to put an old circuit board under the board I'm working on. Uh, so the heat from the soldering iron doesn't melt or cause the parts to melt into the mat here. So that's why you see the circuit board. So let's get started here. I'll just solder on one end. This resistor. The other one. And like that. And then just cut the ends or the leads off here. Like so. Now let's mount the two power resistors. They do get a little bit hot during normal operation of this power supply, so they need to be lifted off the board by a little bit. And by a little, like a couple of millimeters. So let's populate those. Just as before, I'll hold the part over the footprint where it's supposed to be mounted. And I will then line the pliers up so that the outside of the pliers are lined up with the inside of the mounting hole. And then stab the part through the board, grab the lead so that it's aligned with, it needs to be like half a pin diameter to the inside of the mounting hole, give or take. And then I just put the part in, so now it drops right in. But we need a little bit of space, so let's work on that. Just leave yourself a couple of millimeters. Like so. And to prevent it from just you know, pulling back to the board when I'm soldering, I'll put it on the pliers here. And then solder. Ta -da. Now I'll just cut the leads off. Uh, when you cut the leads, uh, you want to leave maybe a millimeter. You don't want it to be completely flush with the board because that cuts into the solder joint. You want to leave, there needs to be a, a nice cone of solder around the pin and then you cut the pin off. Now that I have the resistors and the two small capacitors populated, it's time for the connectors. Connectors can be a little bit annoying to work with uh, because they tend to have short pins and that means that when you place the connector and turn the wood over to solder, the connector is falling out. So one approach is to give the connector a dab of super glue and just super glue it to the board and once the connectors are glued in place, you then solder. Uh, what I like to do especially if it's just one or two connectors that's causing trouble, is that I'll insert the connector in the uh, appropriate spot and I'll then hold it sort of by the tip of my finger or my fingernail here. And then I can turn the board upside down without the connector falling out. I'll then, then let the solder just overhang the workbench by yay much. And then I can solder without the connector falling out. And there it is. So there's one pin and all it takes is one pin for the connector to stay put. I can now finish up the other two pins. just like that. And now it's time for the bridge rectifier and the heatsink. I will mount the rectifier onto the heatsink and then mount the combination of the two onto the circuit board. With the heatsink, beware that one side has this dimple on it and that's not useful for us. We'll be using the flat side. The next thing you need to be aware of is that the rectifier is polarized. So it will have a plus pin that's clearly marked. In this case, that's this pin right here. And that happens to be the pin by the cut corner 
of the package. So that plus pin needs to be aligned with the plus on the circuit board. Between the rectifier and the heat sink, you'll need a bit of, of uh, thermal compound. Uh, Arctic Silver is a common brand that you can probably find at a computer repair place locally. Um, for this spe specific build, I'm using this Abbott phase change material. Uh, the reason I'm using this is because I kind of made the mistake of buying a stick of it. It's a little bit pricey and it's not, actually not as useful as I thought. And the reason for that is that it really only works in the cases where the parts are held onto the heat sink with a uh, spring steel clamp like this. So this clamp will constantly apply pressure between the heat sink and the rectifier and that works well with the phase change material because it's basically I mean it's solid like you can see it's basically uh, um, hard when it's cold but then when it heats up it changes phase it liquefies and fills in all the surface imperfections really nicely um, but in order for that then to work is that you need to have pressure between the part and the heat sink so that the part will end up making good thermal contact once the stuff is melted. So anyway, let me show you how to apply that and then I'll put the um, rectifier onto the heat sink. So I'll start by looking at the polarity markings. So this pin here is plus the this pin here and the plus mark is there on the board so that means the part needs to be mounted like so and that means it needs to get on the heat sink like that so let me apply this face change material the idea is that you just it doesn't work so well in practice but you're supposed to just glide across and then you're supposed to have the correct amount applied then I will flip that over, place it between the two openings here, roughly centered, and then just apply the spring clamp like so. And that now is mounted to the board. And just as before with the connectors, it can be a little bit annoying to work with, but let's see if we can make it work. Sometimes I just stick it upside down and if I apply pressure between uh, the pins like that, it'll stay put. Then now we just need to get one pin of the diode bridge soldered. Like so. And now I finish up the remaining pins. like that and trim the leads. The heat sink has two mechanical supports. That's these two right here. And ideally they should be soldered. Uh, it can be a bit of a pain because it really draws the heat out of the tip of your soldering iron. So if your iron is struggling a bit, I recommend that you glue these with um, two part epoxy. Uh, I am going to use a fairly wide chisel tip on my soldering iron and that gives me enough uh, thermal contact area that I can get these soldered but even then it's struggling just a bit here so as you can see I kind of have to work it around a little bit which is not ideal but it is just a mechanical support like that sort of like painting with solder which is really not what you're supposed to do but it probably works as well as epoxy would. Next up are the two reservoir capacitors. These have been selected for use with the Modulus 86 and Modulus 186. They're equally useful with the LM3886 done right and other LM3886 based amplifiers. You can also use this board with 
you know, any other amplifier that you might have that requires a bipolar supply. In that case, you might need different capacitors. And in that case, you can choose any snap in type capacitor with 10 millimeter pin spacing and a specified diameter of up to 40 millimeters. These are 22,000 microfarads, uh, 50 volts, and 35 millimeters in diameter. So you'll notice there's gonna be a little bit of space between them once they're mounted on the board. These capacitors are snap-in types. That means that they pop straight into the board and they lock in place thanks to the shape of their pins. The minus or cathode side of the capacitor is marked with this white band with the minus signs in it. On the board, the plus is marked, so the other terminal naturally is minus. So let's align minus with minus and pop it straight into the board. Come on, like that. And now the capacitor is locked in place. Now I'll just do the same for the next capacitor. And let's see if I can align the pins correctly. Like that. That's really all there is to it. Now all I have to do is to solder the two pins on each capacitor and the board is almost done. I have switched back to the 1.6 millimeter chisel tip and with that I will just solder the two pins on each capacitor. like so. Now I'll trim the leads and it's now time to wash the flux off the board. And now with the board clean of flux, it's time for the power on LED. That connects at this connector right here. And my intent with that is that you could have a front panel mounted LED that runs with a pair or that connects with a pair of wires to this connector bit right here that plugs into this connector here. And that idea is still perfectly valid. But many choose to add a soft start uh, to their power supply anyway. And I have the um, intelligent start, soft start for that. And that has uh, standby indication, power on in indication, and it has dimmers on the LED and a bunch of other features that are nice to have. So a lot of people tend to build these with this LED sort of being an inside the chassis power on indicator, which I guess is nice to have if um, you ever need to repair the amp, you can at least tell if the power is on. And uh, it actually glows for quite a while after you unplug the power. And that's simply because it's part of the circuit that discharges these two reservoir caps. So um, if the LED is glowing, you still have um, some voltage left on the caps. And it just takes a while for that to discharge. If you don't care so much for the LED, you still have to connect the two terminals in the connector here. You can do that either by bridging the two ter terminals on the bottom of the board or by taking this connector piece and connecting between the two with a piece of wire. And the reason for that is that without that wire, the capacitors will not discharge because these uh, power resistors are essentially disconnected from the circuit. So let's get this hooked up. I align the connector like that and then I look at the board and it says K and A for a cathode and anode. And the cathode of an LED, that's the short pin. So I align that with the cathode pin on the connector. And then you just stab it in there and use a small screwdriver to turn the terminals or to turn the screws that clamp the terminals. Like that. And then if we bend the LED like that, now you have an onboard indicator for power on. Thank you for watching. I hope you found this video useful. If you did, please click like and subscribe to my channel. And um, hopefully this has also inspired you to go and build some audio circuits. And in that case, go to neurochrome.com where you can find the Power86 and many other circuits available for sale.